Loud and clear. Hi, it's Don Johnston with Lima Charlie News. I'm Gail Harris, and I'm still working with Lima Charlie News at the Intelligence and National Security Summit. I just was filled with this sense of this is what I was meant to do. Well, having invested for the past two years in looking at a bunch of veteran-owned companies, being a deployed combat veteran, where we had to make decisions on the fly, pivot, uh, work under a lot of stress, you had the courage to survive those experiences, and what I'm telling you now is that you have the courage to heal from those experiences. This is my hope for people: is if you have something that you're passionate about. Go out there and do it. Take a stand. You know, uh, future tech always comes with two things. Promise and unintended consequences. And it's those consequences that I want to explore. heavy ships are hopelessly outnumbered. I didn't know that was what it was, but I turned to my father and I said, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And he said, this is America. You can be whatever you want to be. Oftentimes, the people who had the biggest resistance to me before I showed up became my biggest supporters. And I tell you, when I'm sitting there giving an intelligence brief to people who are going to go in harm's way, they didn't care what color I was or if I was attractive or if I was fat, if my uniform didn't look right. They cared about what came out of my mouth. And it is a calling, as corny as it sounds, that you want to protect the nation. And my attitude is I may not agree with what you say or your political views, but I will defend what my life, your right to say it. I think what I would like for my legacy to be, one team, one fight. In the workplace, one team, one fight. It doesn't matter if a coworker is purple. If they can do the job, they're on the team and they're your teammate and you give them that respect. When you look at me and you see a black woman, then you still get work to do. But if you look at me in this setting and just see a woman, then you're where you need to be. And I think we're getting there. I, I think we're getting there. You, being a correspondent and of the many myriad things that you have done in your life and ladies and gentlemen for those of you who are uninitiated I am sitting next to uh, author speaker radio host Lima Charlie news correspondent uh, cyber and homeland security expert uh, captain uh, Gail Harris it's a pleasure to have you here <laughs> it, it's a pleasure well it's great to be here so um, uh, Anthony and I have been talking about you for months and months and months, and I have been saying that I would love to get together with you and do a podcast and just, you know, have your uh, just incredible breadth of uh, knowledge on the military, the world, and everything uh, that is going on on display and so I'm really happy to be able to sit here and talk to you we're talking about transitions and before we do that I just gotta read a little bit of your bio here because it's this is incredible a former uh, United States Navy officer Gail Harris was the highest ranking female African-American in the US Navy upon her retirement in December of 2001 she served as the first female intelligence officer in a Navy aviation squadron in 1973 in 1979 Captain Harris became the first female and African-American instructor at the Armed Forces Air Intelligence Training Center at Lowry Air Force Base in Colorado in 19 1989, she became the first female 
and African American to lead the intelligence department for Fleet Air Reconnaissance Squadron in Rota, Spain, the largest Navy aviation squadron. You, after your name, somehow the word first just keeps popping up. The first female, first African American. How does that happen? Timing. <laughs> <laughs> I just entered the Navy at the right time when they were opening up to women and minorities. There was a, one person that doesn't get a lot of credit, okay. Admiral Elmo Zumwalt. I think he was the youngest chief of naval operations. And when they made him in charge of the Navy, believe it or not, there were race riots on aircraft carriers. There was a drug problem in all the services, kind of part of the Vietnam legacy. Yes. Um, and he's, you know, women, not counting the nurses, in the Navy there were only 400 women officers and most career fields were closed to women. If you were a woman in the military, uh, you did not get paid the same as a man. A man who was married got the extra housing allowance, women didn't. You couldn't have children, not even stepchildren. So Admiral Zumwalt reached out to the United States and said, I know we're not perfect, but please come and help us perfect this. Wow. And uh, when I was chosen to go to intelligence training, I was number four to in attend the school, and the program was so new, number two and three were still there. So by virtue of the Navy opening up a lot of the career fields and, and the timing, and I've got to say that I stand on the shoulders of all the women who have served in the services, even in the Revolutionary War. Yes. A lot of people don't realize, I didn't realize that Harriet Tubman is known as the first woman to officially be a part of the army and she led troops in combat during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So I stand on the shoulders of all who come, came before and what I like to say about my time in the service, I'm honored that my ceiling became the next generation's floor. Wow. Well, that's fantastic. And I love the fact that you are uh, so humble as to set aside all hubris and say timing is the key. But I can, I can assure you that, you know, your fortitude and your uh, tenacity had something to do with that. Because I can just, let me just say this, uh, I, I stand on your shoulders just because the fact that you have been uh, the first in so many ways, uh, what that does is it opens doors, not just in the military, but in society. And um, all I can tell you is, uh, as a black man in America in 2017, uh, you know, it's not all rainbows and sunshine is all I'm gonna say. Uh, so I know for a fact that back then, being a black woman in the positions that you were in, you had to, you had to encounter a lot of vehement resistance. I did. And, you know, one of the things I tell people, they say, oh, you know, you're just whining, it didn't happen. I said, well, I know for a fact. Every time I showed up at a new organization, they didn't want me. And they said, how do you know that? Their wives told me. Uh. <laughs> and the way they tell me, I'd be at a social occasion, they said, now Gail, don't tell my husband I told you. But when he first heard you were coming, he hated your guts because you're a woman. And it didn't help that you were black. <laughs> but now he just loves you to death. And now he loves you. And that's because to me, you know, my father was my primary mentor. You know, he told me if somebody had a problem with, with me because I was black and female, make sure it was their problem and not mine. Those are very good words. And so I just, I'm here to do a job, you know, you have a problem with, I don't want to hear it. Right. And the intelligence community for my first job when they chose, they gave me some jokes to open up, you know, and one I could never repeat, but I'm told it's still being told around the fleet. Oh no. <laughs> now I got to hear it. <laughs> a, well, a forbidden joke, I, now I got to hear this. Well, this is the first time I've told this story publicly, I have to say. Uh, my first, you know, think of it as a news head, you know, an anchor. Right. And so I said to my first presentation, hi guys, uh, I'm Ensign Harris, and in case you hadn't noticed, I'm a girl. There were a few nervous chuckles. And I said, I sure would like to go flying with you guys, but then I guess I'd just be another black box. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I've never said that in public. <laughs> I told you it was. <laughs> First of all, let me just say this. Now, you know, what I do for a living is I am a stand-up comedian. That is what I do for a living. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. I credit the intelligence community. They gave me that. Yeah, joke. that's it. Let me tell you something. I, you know, first of all, any joke like that, because people will be like, oh my God. But whenever, that's, uh, whenever that is the, uh, the response, you know you did something right. <laughs> if you're a comedian and people go like this, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> mm. So, uh, <laughs> that, is, that is amazing. Um, so uh, let me, let me you, you built the Navy's first course on ocean surveillance information systems, and you taught anti-submarine warfare and Soviet surface operations courses. And uh, here is what I want to know because of that. Um, are you able to do an impression of Sean Connery from the hunt for Red October? <laughs> No, I think I could maybe come closer. Who was it, Alec Baldwin? Yeah. Yes, Alec Baldwin's character. Yeah. They're gonna turn to the left or the right. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> oh man. All right, so you, uh, that to the left. <laughs> um, so you have such an esteemed career. Here's what I'm interested to know from your personal standpoint. And I know you say you stand on the shoulders of those who came before you and, you know, timing and that. And all those things have a modicum of uh, truth uh, with, with, with respect to your story. But here's what I'd like to know from your own personal standpoint. Were you looking at these tasks before you going, you know what, that, that looks good, I'm going to do that? Or was it a matter of you were given an opportunity and a job and you just rose to the occasion in such a place, in such a fashion that it was undeniable, like, wow, look at this person and what they are doing, or a combination of the two? I, I think it was, really, I think it was insecurity. You know, I had this drive to be one of the best intelligence officers in history. And I had a lot of, as you said, a lot of resistance. And I didn't want to give up. And so most of the jobs that I got, I didn't think that I'd be able to do it. And so what I would do, like for instance, one of my favorite jobs, I was at the Naval War College and I was part of the intelligence detachment. And my job was to play the opposition for these war games when President Reagan was the president, he said all the mil Navy and uh, Marine uh, military commanders, before their operational plans became accepted as this is what we're going to do, they had to be tested out. Mm -hmm. So you have all these admirals and generals coming in, and then they find out that their opposition is Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to get up to speed on some things. I knew a lot about the Soviet uh, military equipment. I didn't know as much about the Navy equipment unless it was something that I'd work with. Mm -hmm. So I had, I sat down and, and people, they mentored me. I'd sit down to a U.S. submarine commander and say, how do you choose where you want to operate? Uh, how far can you be from a Soviet submarine and detect it? Uh, you know, I just asked all these detailed questions and people were fantastic. And I remember once I was sitting down at a war game, and it was we were playing World War III, and there were so many engagements. They said, "Hey, uh, uh, so wait, just one second. I, that's I, I'm like absolutely shocked that I'm sitting here with somebody having a kind of yeah. So we were playing World War III. <laughs> that was my reality. Like that is a that's serious stuff. But that was ahead. my reality. So. They said, uh, we, don't, we can't do all of the engagements on computers, why don't you do back and forth? So we did, and I'm talking with this, another Navy commander, and I was junior to him at the time. And he said, well, I think I'd beat you because of such and such. I said, you did because of A, B, and C. And his jaw dropped, and he said, I didn't expect that you would be so well informed. Mm. And my, I guess my notoriety came, we were playing World War III, and I was in charge of the Soviet military in the Pacific. And the U.S. Navy had five aircraft carriers, and I got rid of four. 
Damn. He and you're not. My battleship. <laughs> yes. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, people thought I was going to get fired. The CIA offered me a job. <laughs> they said, well, the Navy's going to fire you. You come work for us. Right. You can still hear the screams of the admirals. Now, the interesting thing was, uh, as this scenario was developing, I went to the U.S. Navy admirals and, and I said, guys, uh, I, try, I said, I wouldn't suggest that you do this with your aircraft carriers. Uh, blah, I gave them reasons why, and they kind of, that's all right, Gail. Right. I said, I tried to tell you. Wow, so you even gave them a little heads up and, and still spanked them. Yeah. 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 That's, that's pretty well. My I next job, uh, by the way, was on the Pacific Fleet, the Navy's Pacific Fleet staff. And the War College wanted me to come back. The war game, we were <laughs> continued over several summers. And the Pacific Fleet Admiral said, no, if Gail comes back to Newport, she's coming back as my intelligence officer. And that's exactly what I did. That's amazing. But yeah, there was, uh, there was a lot of upset over when I did that. In fact, the official records are changed. I said this in my book, so it's not, you know, they, uh, the, the Pacific Fleet guy said, we want our carriers back, and and so they gave. Well, we're not going to participate in this game. And these are the real world military commanders. And so they gave them them back. And so I went to my boss. What about my forces? I want my submarines and aircraft back. Yeah. And I'm stomping my feet and cursing and carrying on. And my boss said, Gil, this game is for the U.S. Navy, not the Soviet Navy. I went, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. go on my forces yeah. back. But you know what? And that's pretty cool because you're, you know, it's like a scrimmage. Like you're, yeah. you're playing a scrimmage game uh, against, you know, it's in, and in a scrimmage game, you, you have all your starters in there. Right. Okay. And you have the two coaches, your offensive and defensive, defensive coach going against each other's schemes. Yeah. And, you know, so you you're, you're actually did a great service, but at the same time, it's just so funny that just like in real war games when you were a kid, it's just like, I shot you, Timmy. It's like, you ain't shoot me. I, it, it ricocheted off a rock. I'm, by the way, this is a mirror, and I'm over there. Like, you know, so. <laughs> well, the way they should have done that, and if I hadn't been, I think, so into the game, I, I, I would have said, let's run that scenario again. Right. Let's say that they knew that I still had the large number of forces that I used against them. Right. And how would they change what they've done? And that way it wouldn't have been as uh, controversial. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. Speaking of intelligence, so, uh, you know, that was the next incarnation of your career. And uh, right now, I, and I just want you to speak to this, it's a little <laughs> off uh, the topic of transitioning, but. You know, we're in a time right now where perhaps um, the intelligence community is not as appreciated as it should be. And I'd just like you to speak to the importance of the intelligence community. And I don't think a lot of people are aware, but there is a bit of a degradation of the intelligence community in terms of resources, in terms of, you know, and speak to this across the board, funding, in terms of readiness, all of that, you know, I think, I don't know why this isn't in the news, but that's why Lima Charlie exists. So exactly. can you speak to that? Yeah, I think this is nothing new. I know one of the things that I had to learn when I first joined the military is being an intelligence professional is like being a kicker on an NFL team. People know you're kind of part of the team, but you're weird. <laughs> so you have to prove you have to prove your value. And one of the reasons that I spent the first year uh, after I got out of the Navy writing my book, A Woman's War, is because after 9/11 there was all this criticism, and I was irate. Not because people were criticizing the intelligence community, but because the critics didn't know what they were talking about okay. when they said the intelligence community <clears throat> didn't share information. Uh, it's hard to get figures on the amount of information that's passed, but in 2007, the then head of the intelligence community, Admiral McConnell, said every 24 hours, the intelligence community put out one billion pieces of information. And we send it to each other. We send most of the stuff to each other. And then that same year, I went to a conference in Chicago sponsored by the intelligence community. They said, out of that, you know how much is actually looked at and, had, and by analysts, by human beings? One-tenth million. Hmm. And so when they said that the intelligence community wasn't sharing, what they really were talking about was, as I was raised as an intelligence officer, the first thing you do when you come into work 
is you pick up the phone and you call your counterparts in other areas and say, have you seen this? What do you think about it? Is there something else I should know? And when something hot comes up, you let the other people know because there's so much information. So it wasn't, I've only run into a couple of instances when people weren't giving me information that I needed for the most part. So you have to pick up and call and talk to each other. That's what was not being shared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, that the public uh, needs to have a better understanding. What we do is very similar to journalists. It's just our sources of information are different. And when you have something like it's very rare for the intelligence community 100% to agree on something, on analysis. So you got to know that if they do, then that's something fairly significant. The difference between journalism and intelligence, if a journalist makes a mistake, nobody's going to die. Right. If we make a mistake, somebody can die. I mean, unless it's CNN. Fake news. <laughs> fake news. Fake news. Fake news. You are fake news. <laughs> the other thing is that I tell people to understand about intelligence, the battle, movie about the Battle of Midway is how I got involved at the age of five that I wanted to join the Navy and be an intelligence officer. But you recall at Pearl Harbor, most of our Navy in the Pacific was destroyed. So uh, the, they knew the Japanese were going to do a follow one strike. And so the intelligence community had broken the Japanese code, meaning they could read all their messages of what they were doing with their forces. But they could only read 20% of the traffic. And based on that 20%, they said to Admiral Nimitz, this is where we need to concentrate our forces. We think we see the so the, uh, we see the Japanese moving fleets toward Alaska and toward Hawaiian Islands. Alaska's a faint, 20%. So Admiral Nimitz said, "Show me." And so the Japanese had these code words that they used for the, the Hawaiian Islands. And Midway was Alpha Foxtrot AF. So what they did was have the Navy forces on Midway say they were having troubles with their water distillation. And then a few days later, the Japanese put out a message, AF is having water problems. Nice. Now, based on just reading 20%, and this is typical, you will not see, when we're looking at problems that are going on and trying to figure out what's happening, we're not, we don't have the complete picture. And you have seconds. And another story I tell from, from my time, and this isn't classified, I think I had put it in my book, and it was approved by the Pentagon, <laughs> Thank God. When the ballistic missile submarines, the Russians go on patrol, they don't communicate. One day I was the intelligence officer in charge in the Pacific Fleet, the Western Seventh Fleet area. A submarine on patrol with nuclear tipped missiles communicated and then it surfaced. And I had a few minutes to decide whether Seventh Fleet should destroy it, were they getting ready to launch their missiles, or was something else going on? So I said, I think they have a medical or a mechanical problem. They said, how do you know that? I said, they don't have to surface to launch their missiles. Right. Looking at the Russian, the Soviet communications, they're not in any increased status. There's nothing going on in the world politically. So that is what the young intelligence officers, most of them in their late teens and early 20s, do every single day and get no credit because people don't know what they're doing because they do it in a classified environment. Absolutely. So I wrote my book, and I speak on these topics to give honor to those people, to let somebody know what they're doing. If we're sitting here now, there are young men and women making even more difficult decisions than I had to about what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And they have to take all of this information and figure out what's going on. Yeah. So I say I give honor to them. Well, I, let me just say this. We are out of time, and God, this was a fascinating. We never even got into the, the actual subject matter at hand, which to you I apologize, but that just means that we're going to have to do that at a different <laughs> time. And uh, we give honor to you, and your tremendous service to this country, and your tremendous service to society, and the fact that you are just an incredible person. And uh, uh, in the words of um, someone who may be quite powerful, you are very, 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 very good. <laughs>
Gail Harris, Captain Gail Harris. Thanks, Gail. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was. Well, I'm glad I flew in. I was like, "Oh, thank you." Listen.